we have flown the Inspire 3 for over four months. Traveling throughout Norway, attempting to create our most difficult drone shop ever. Action! And found some flaws you should know of. If you're considering this drone or just like to watch cool tech, this is the video for you. DJI has had a near monopoly on camera drones for the past decades, and they have been pushing out new drones fast, or at least in the more consumer-oriented part of their lineup. Their flagship integrated camera drone, the Inspire 2, had to wait so long for an update that the users felt like even DJI's tiniest drones had more advanced features. So compared to the Inspire 2, basically everything is new. I'll go into details later, but the brief overview is that the Inspire 3 features the new X9 8K Air Gimbal, featuring a full frame sensor capable of shooting 8K raw video at up to 75 frames per second. The drone now has omnidirectional sensing system in all directions and an updated FPV camera, which is a lot higher quality than what you would find on the Inspire 2. The top speed is 94 kilometers per hour. The storage is the same as on the Ronin 4D, these one terabyte SSD drives with the built-in USB-C port, so no more card readers, which is nice. The legs of the Inspire 3 have three different positions, pointing down for taking off and when you want the camera to tilt up. Uh, you can have the legs upwards for normal flying and 360 pan of the camera, or you can have them straight out in travel mode when putting it in the suitcase. Speaking of the suitcase, it comes included and it's of a similar size to like a standard travel suitcase. It seems to be a great build quality and can fit all the lenses, two controllers, chargers, and batteries. And the batteries for the Inspire 3 is a new TB51 99 watt hours, of which the drone uses two at the same time. This gives the Inspire 3 an estimated 28 minutes of flight time, according to DJI. We'll come back to that later. The charger can fit four pairs of batteries, and the Inspire 3 also has a port for time code, which is a neat feature. The drone comes in at $16,499, and this includes a controller, six batteries, charger, a one terabyte SSD, and a suitcase. With lenses, additional storage, one more controller, and the filters, you're likely to spend more than $20,000 on this thing. So this is definitely not a cheap toy. But is it worth it? That's what we're gonna find out in this video. Let's start with how this thing flies. This is a big drone, like five times bigger than the Mavic 3, for example. But when flying it solo, it feels so very much like flying a Mavic. And that's a good thing. The Inspire 3 is snappy, it's stable and responsive. And the updated GNSS system and other sensors makes this a super stable drone. I've been flying in quite a bit of wind and never had a problem. The controller is the DJI RC Plus, which we have seen in some of DJI's enterprise lineup before. It has a 7-inch uh, screen, and the screen has a 1200 nits uh, peak brightness. It has plenty of customizable shortcut buttons so that you can control the aperture, shutter, ISO, switch to the FEV camera, go full screen, or lots of other options without having to touch the screen. Maybe the best thing about the controller, though, is the battery life. It has a built-in batteries, which lasts for like three, four hours, but it also can take hot swappable WB37s, which is the same as you would have on the DJI Hybrid monitor or the RTK module, for example. With this, you can go all day shooting. The controller is quite heavy, but it has a strap for comfortable holding all day long. While flying the Inspire 3 with only one pilot works great, it is with two pilots, it really shines. In this mode, you can have one pilot controlling the aircraft and taking care of safety, watching the FPV camera, while the other operator controls the gimbal. And the two controllers connect independently to the aircraft, so the two pilots don't have to stand close to each other. If one loses connection, uh, the other can take control and continue flying. A nice thing is that you can change the second controller with the DJI Hybrid monitor. 
Here you get a little limited controls, but you can control the gimbal with the joystick and pull focus with the wheel. And it also opens up the gateway to this part of DJI's ecosystem with STI transmitters and so on. In terms of flight time, we got on average around 21 minutes before we felt like we had to land the drone. So that's in the ballpark of what you could expect when flying this drone. The most important thing for us in a drone is how the camera performs. The specs are undoubtedly impressive, but how does it hold up in real world use? The main key for me for good image quality is dynamic range and how well the image holds up when grading it in post. A drone is more often than not used as a B camera to an A camera on the ground, so being able to match it to other cameras is really important. So I went ahead and tested the Inspire 3 to some of our grand cameras. Here represented by the cinema camera we use the most, the Canon C300 Mark III, which is known for having quite good dynamic range, and the Sony A1, one of my favorite cameras, which can shoot 8K and has a beautiful image quality. DJI boasts more than 14 stops of dynamic range, and as you can see in this test, it is very comparable to our other cameras. Lab tests done by others also support our experience here. The base ISO is 804,000, meaning that you'll get good dynamic range and relatively clean noise performance at ISO 4000. And looking at it compared to the C300 and A1, it holds up very well. Getting video like this at night really gives another dimension to the drone and is a game changer compared to the old Inspire 2. From my experience, the image coming out of the Inspire 3 is beautiful. The dynamic range is good and colors are fantastic. However, there is one big drawback. The rolling shutter on the Inspire 3 is not good. And if there's one camera you would want to have with good rolling shutter performance, it's a fast flying drone. This drone is built for flying next to cars with trees and light poles swooshing in between. And this is a real deal breaker. Cine D measured the rolling shutter to be 31.3 milliseconds, which is like twice as much as what you would see in most similar cameras nowadays. If you shoot in 60 FPS or higher, the readout speed halves to 16.3, which is a much more acceptable result. When filming our first little short film with Inspire, we had our main character running over the bridge while the Inspire 3 was tracking next to him. We had to change the frame rate to 60 FPS in order to get an acceptable result here. Even here, we did see some rolling shutter. The problem with shooting 60 FPS is that the dynamic range of the camera decreases. It's also worth noting that the native ISO changes from 804,000 to 320, 1600. The image is still good enough in my opinion and the sharpness and clarity of the picture is basically the same, but it is something to be aware of if shooting in high contrast scene. Your uh, dynamic range will be a stop or so less. Where the picture really suffers though is in 4K 120. In these frame rates, the image goes from a nice oversample 4K to line skip. And this means that the image becomes far less detailed. In terms of recording options, it has pretty much everything you would want. It shoots in H.264 up to 4K 120 and ProRes 422HQ up to 8K 30. You can also activate the raw license for an additional thousand bucks or so. And this lets you shoot Cinema DNG up to 8K 25 or ProRes RAW up to 8K 75. Although uh, when you go from 8K 60 to 8K 75, uh, you will add a 2.39 crop. So it's using less vertical space of sensor. Having the option to shoot RAW is nice, but I find myself shooting uh, the ProRes 422HQ most of the time because it's such easy fast to work with. Because the sensor is of so high resolution, you can also shoot in cropped in Super 35 in 5.5K RAW uh, or in 4K ProRes uh, 422 HQ, which is really nice if you want a little bit of extra reach. Bringing me on to the next topic, 
lenses. The 8K Air camera module comes with DJI's own DL mount, meaning you can use the same lenses as you could with the Inspire 2. Only the 16mm will not work as it was made for the Inspire 2 smaller sensor. Instead, it has been replaced with a new 18mm. So now you have a lineup of 18mm, 24, 35, and 50. I am really missing a bit more tele here, but DJI has said that uh, a tele lens is in the work. We have the 18, 35, and 50. They're all super sharp and clinical. They don't have any character to them, but I think this is the right choice as this drone will be paired with many different ground cameras and lenses. So it's better to add those characters in post. Speaking of these lenses, they have a filter thread of 46 millimeter, except the 18 millimeter, which has a 55 millimeter. It is a bit annoying that it is bigger as this means you need two sets of filters. You could probably use a step-up ring, but we haven't tested it out to see how it affects the gimbal balance, but the gimbal seems pretty strong, so you should probably be all right with that. What we have gone with is variable ND filters, um, some high quality one to five styles variable from Nisi and BW. We're also going to buy some five to nine stops because only five stops is not enough when shooting midday. Finding any filters are not hard, just buy something off B&H or something. The problem is that you need them in the first place. The Ronin 4D's X9 module has a fantastic built-in ND filter system and seeing them not included in the air module was a huge bummer. This is in my opinion, the biggest drawback of the Inspire 3 together with the rolling shutter. There's one kind of camera you want built in any filter. It is a drone because you don't want to have to land your drone every time you want to change your exposure. An example was when I was filming Anders swimming in this lake, I set up the ND filter to give a nice exposure with the lens wide open at f2.8 for a tiny bit of background blur. Then I wanted to get a top shot of the same scene and it was just way too dark. I, I could land the drone and remove the ND filters, but I didn't want to risk any drowning out in that lake. So I pushed ISO up to 4000 instead, which is it's okay, but it's not ideal. So for a drone, built-in ND filters would be great. Unfortunately, DJI decided to skip it. The reason why DJI skipped it is obviously weight. Uh, this is going to be pure speculation for me, but the aircraft weighs 3,995 grams, including the gimbal, camera, battery, lenses, SSDs, and propellers. So this seems an awful lot like they were trying to get below four kilograms, right? But why? The only thing I could think of is that the European drone laws. For those not familiar with this, drones can get classified into different classes, C0, C1, C2, C3, and C4. Depending on which class your drone are, it can be more or less restricted as to where you can fly and what license you need. If your drone is classified as C0, which is small drones under 250 grams, you'll have much less restrictions than a mega drone classified in C4. I was hoping that the Inspire 3 would be classified in C2 two categories for drones under four kilograms. This means I could fly in the A2 category, which lets you fly close to people and buildings without having to go through a lot of paperwork. However, the Inspire 3 is unfortunately not classified in C2, but in C3. This means I have to fly it in the A3 category, which is much more restricted. Of course, for bigger productions, uh, which I guess this drone is meant for, you would fly in a specific category outside of this A1, A2, A3. But being able to fly in A2 for small stuff would be great. Anyway, my point here is it seems like DJI was trying to push the weight under the four kilograms limit to reach the C2 requirements, but somehow didn't get it. Making a drone will always be a trade-off between weight and hence fly time and functions. And the limiting factor here is the batteries. And these are 99 watt hours, which is of course not a coincidence. 100 watt hours is the biggest you're allowed to easily bring on an airplane. So DJI probably have the choice between adding cool new features like ND filters or possibility of bigger lenses like on the Ronin 4D or additional flight time by adding much bigger batteries 
For example, like we've seen those Enterprise Matrix 350 RTK drone, which I think can fly for like almost an hour, but that will make it really difficult to bring it on an airplane. The best, of course, would be if you could choose to use these really big batteries, but that will make it back heavy. So yeah, I guess making drones are difficult. The coolest feature of the DJI Inspire 3 is, in my opinion, the RTK mode. This has been something that's been common in enterprise drones, but is now making its way into filmmaking drones. RTK stands for real-time kinematics and basically makes the GNS signal much more accurate. Because of the great distance between drones and, and the satellites, the atmospheric variation makes small inaccuracies uh, in the position data when using GPS alone. This is why you would add an RTK base station. Uh, this will be a fixed reference point on the ground which the drone can use to triangulate with and in real time compensate for the small uh, position drift caused by the atmosphere. The position accuracy goes from like a meter with normal GNSS signal to closer to a centimeter with the RTK. Usually this kind of stuff is used in industries where they are mapping areas with high precision, but it's now come to us filmmakers and it opens up a lot of possibilities. In addition to more stable hovering and positioning of your drone, you would use RTK in waypoint mode. You can use waypoints without RTK as well, but it's with RTK it really shines. In this mode, you can set different waypoints manually or automatically as you fly. And you can also edit the waypoints later on the map if you want to. And you can fly the drone through these waypoints in two different modes, either repeatable routes or 3D dolly. Repeatable routes lets you set the speed and direction and the Inspire will fly through the route without you having to do anything. The 3D dolly works much in the same way, but here you can control the speed manually when flying the route. You don't have to worry about the drone's path, only the speed uh, of the drone by moving the joystick forward, or you can reverse it along the same path by pulling it backwards. This is really nice if you're like following an actor which doesn't always move at the same uh, pace. So yeah, great use case. In both modes, you can either let the gimbal follow the angle uh, you had during the waypoints or manual control it while the drone flies through the route. Both of these features are great and it makes being a pilot so much easier. Being able to program the uh, uh, route on beforehand and only having to worry about pointing the camera in the right direction is a fantastic feature, especially for those who work with bigger crews. One of the possibilities which came up with the RK waypoints was to merge two different shots into one. For example, a day shot into a night shot or duplicate a person while the drone was flying with movement. This got me thinking we can do the same shot and duplicate ourselves, which is cool, but the repeatable route function also lets you set the speed and reverse the direction. Hmm. Today we're gonna do a shoot, which I don't think has ever been done with a drone before. Uh, <laughs> unless somebody's doing it right now, because this has not been possible without this drone. So we're gonna be bending time and we're gonna do repeatable moves. We're gonna go backwards, we're gonna go forwards, we're gonna go fast motion, we're gonna go slow motion. Maybe Kim just walk down to the wall, towards the water in normal. Uh, maybe with a fishing uh, rod or something. Okay. Then it would be fun to have just a duplicate of one person. So I was thinking maybe Emma could be sitting by the fire. And then we're gonna have somebody who is running with a bucket of water and then tumbling Ooh. over and that's gonna be you on this. <laughs> and then Matthias is gonna be tricking with a ball or something in uh, reverse. So you c if you can find some tricks that look strange in reverse. If I could do it right. <laughs> In Maria is going to be picking uh, wood in reverse. Really? And then we will, I think we'll do a badminton in fast. It's very important that we are quick so the sun doesn't move too much. Okay, let's go. Yeah. Okay. So we are using the RTK for this so we can do repeatable moves. This is apparently going to give us centimeter accuracy on the drone, which will make it possible to do this kind of repeatable stuff. And I'm going to use waypoint 
to add a, a route here and then we can do different speeds and do everything in reverse. I think we have a safe zone here, so everybody that's not in the shots will be here. That would play that. Moving to start point. Arrived at start point. Action! Starting task. Next one. Oye, Maria. Mission complete. I think centimeter accuracy is a little bit too exaggerate, uh, especially when you're doing uh, different speeds on it, because then it will take slightly different paths. Uh, obviously, it's like in the air. Um, but we, uh, Matthias and I, we have been working on this for quite a while now. It's a bit of a job uh, in post to match it together because the perspective is always like a little bit different. So you have to uh, actually rotoscope out the people. But once you do that, it works quite nicely. Some of the shots we haven't nailed like perfectly, but I think someone that's really good at VFX could could do this. But yeah, um, I think we've got to a point where it's like, okay, it's good enough for this demonstration. It's not perfect, but it looks pretty good. So that's pretty cool. For me, these functions are what takes the Inspire 3 from just like just smaller drones with better image quality to a drones that actually add a lot of value on a film set. One drawback though uh, with the RTK, which we have a problem with through all the months who are filming with it, is it's hard to get a stable connection. Once the RTK base station was set up, it can take anywhere from like three seconds to 10 minutes to get a connection with your drone if you get any at all. Uh, so unfortunately the RTK uh, kept bugging so we couldn't connect to it and, or it kept falling out and um, so we're gonna try to do that shot another place. We did some tests a couple of days ago and it was working perfectly. I've not found any correlation to when we're having trouble to connect. I've had trouble connecting in the wide open field and no problem in a dense forest like this. When getting the connection, it's usually quite stable, but not always. Uh, when doing the backward forwards tenet shot thing, it was working flawlessly, but then I had to land to change battery and it disconnected, even though I didn't turn the drone off. I was quite in a hurry because I didn't want the light to change or anything like that. So it was quite frustrating. I think it took like five minutes before I got it connecting again. So super annoying, especially if the rest of the film set is, is waiting for you. Aside from that, awesome feature. Aside from the waypoints, what features does it pack? Because the Inspire 3 is made for pilots that, you know, actually know how to fly drone, it doesn't have most of those automatic features like master shots and stuff from the consumer drones. I don't think it would hurt to add them though, especially the hyperlapse and panorama functions would be great and I kind of miss them. In addition to waypoints, it does have Spotlight Pro, uh, which is similar to what we see on, on smaller drones and this lets you select a subject and the gimbal will track this. It's great when you're solo operating, especially I like to use it in a flying solo in a bit of a tricky conditions where I need to use the FPV camera for a better overview. It does lose track of the subject though, a bit more often than I would hope for. It's still a nice feature to have. One feature that is amazing though, is the ability to tilt the camera up 80 degrees when having the legs down. This opens up a lot of possibilities for cool shots and I found this very useful. Another thing I've been thinking about when flying is that continuous autofocus would actually be really nice. And usually I don't think autofocus is a huge deal on cinema cameras and these systems are built for bigger productions, but it would have been so nice doing shots when you're closer to people, for example, like when we have this running shots. The camera is full frame, so with f2.8 lenses, you are going to get a bit of depth of field. 
having autofocus could turn a three-man, you know, pilot gimbal operator focus puller setup into just a two-man pilot gimbal operator setup. Or if using Spotlight Pro, you could have gotten all those shots flying alone if you had autofocus. It would have been nice, but it's not a huge deal. So is the Inspire 3 worth the hefty price tag? It does have many flaws and the rolling shutter is a big issue. The flight time doesn't really impress anybody. And I was hoping for built-in ND filters. Yet the images are fantastic. The handling is amazing. The controllers are basically flawless and the ecosystem around this is becoming very, very good. If you are an occasional solo drone operator used to flying a Mavic to get B-rolls for your travel films or whatever, this is not for you. If you're a part of a production company like us, or a drone is your main thing, maybe you already have an Inspire 2, go for it. There's nothing better out there, and this drone belongs on film sets. You can get some really cool shots with this, and yeah, I'm looking forward to using it more.